thank you for the introduction. So um, I'm a PhD student at Paritech in France, and I'm supervised by Albert Cohen and Kurt Avanti. And this work is part of an ongoing collaboration with um, the Chair of Compass Construction and the Chair of Fluid Mechanics at TU Dresden. So um, just a quick um, remind, reminder about sensors. They, are, they, can, they can be seen as n-dimensional arrays. And one of the reasons why they are heavily used in numerical applications in several domains like quantum chemistry, machine learning, or big data is because um, the kind of data manipulated in these domains and the operations that occur on them are easily expressed as tensor operations. So because of that and the kind of um, intensively computing um, applications that we have, several types of domains have been, uh, sorry, of tools have been developed um, during, uh, in diff um, from different aspects and that some, some of them are quite generic in terms of expressivity and some other are much more domain specific. And uh, on the aspect of optimization heuristics, um, they, the, the tools vary uh, depending on if the, the heuristics are completely hidden from the user or if they are more much more adaptive, flexible, and um, open to the, the user of these tools. So in computational fluid dynamics, the tensors that, that are involved have some quite interesting characteristics. They are relatively small. Um, for instance, um, the size of the dimensions can be maybe at most 13, uh, 13 elements. So the loops iterating over these dimensions are very small, like you can have 13 iterations, sometimes a bit more than that, but it's, it's a bit, yeah, it really depends. And so the number of dimensions that we can have in the loops are maybe at most four dimensions, and tensor contractions, outer products, and entry multiplications are the type of operators that are often, and often encountered in these applications. So this kind of operation occurs for every element in the mesh, and the mesh can have uh, around thousands of elements. So inverse Helmholtz here is an example of one of the bottleneck in the applications in computational free dynamics. So basically, the computation has three parts. The first part is a tensor contraction between a matrix and a 3D tensor on three axes on, of the tensor U here, and the result is used to compute um, another intermediate tensor that is an entry rise multiplication, and then this new result is also reused to compute another tensor contraction, but this time with the non transpose axis of A. And so, for this type of application, we were quite interested in being able to develop a tool in which we could generate different variants of programs with different optimization techniques to improve the performances, and the search phase could include different orders of tensor contractions since we have the question of associativity, of associativity in this kind of expression. And on the loop domain, we could maybe perform some fusions with interchanges, play with the layout of the data with transpositions and apply maybe vectorizations or collapsing. I mean, we have a search space that is quite interesting here, but we still have to carefully choose where we, and how we're going to apply the transformations because of the, because of the type of data that is used. So since there are already existing tools that could be useful for that, we, that's a non-exhaustive list. But as an example, we have different kind of tools with different levels of expressivity and optimization heuristics. For instance, if we take the example of Chill and TVN, they don't have the same level of expressivity. But Chill is much more expressive in the sense that it's, it's a lower level of, of abstraction, not we, we, so we can almost express any kind of computation in that. But both have the same level of flexibility in the way we can apply transformations because they both provide constructs for the user to implement himself the, the sequences of transformations that he will want to do. On the other hand, we have Pluto, which is a bit less flexible. We have to tell Pluto what kind of optimization we want him to apply. Like, say, uh, for instance, ask Pluto to do some fusion and tiling, and then Pluto is going to decide himself what is the best heuristic that has to be applied. And on the other hand, we have much more um, domain-specific and uh, hidden heuristics of optimizations that are used for the tensor contraction engine, since this one was really built for quantum chemistry, and also the example of tensor flow, a bit more generic than TCE, 
but still um, built for people that maybe just don't want to bother about what kind of optimization has to be um, applied for the for the deep learning application. So despite having all of these tools available, we still have several limitations in applying our CFD kernel because we encountered different levels of limitations. Sometimes it was the lack of expressivity to be able to write, simply write our application. Other times it, it was not a question of the expressivity. Maybe the tools didn't have any optimization ability. Other times it was just on adapted heuristics for the optimization. And the last, maybe not the worst one, since if, if uh, the, the last limitation was sometimes um, the, the, the lack of adapting construct, but to me that's not the worst one because we can still extend some tools. So. But still, since we couldn't really find one that was suitable for our tool flow, we decided to work on an intermediate language that could be suitable for our problem. And the main idea of this language is to be able to declare tensor computations and optimization heuristics. So basically, arrays, tensor operators, iterators, and loop transformation are considered as, are considered as first class citizens. And the Envision tool flow is to have um, for instance, as a source file, a C or a DSL, that would translate into the intermediate language that could be also meta-programmed by an expert. And then from this intermediate language, we could generate easily different variants of the program and search for the best um, version. But still, um, as showed earlier, the CFD kernels have several common operators, tensor operators, as in other domains like the tensor contraction. So instead of just building an intuitive language that would be suitable for the CFD domain, we wanted to at least have enough flexibility and genericity to be able to apply this same intermediate language in other domains. And so when, when I talk about genericity, at least at the level of tensor applications, and maybe um, after, with, with time we'll be able to be much more generic than that. So. Um, as an example, um, with inverse Helmholtz, the first step in using this intermediate language will be simply to declare the computation. So as I said earlier, inverse Helmholtz has a series of tensor contraction here, and, and an entry-wise multiplication, and then another tensor contraction. So here we already assume that we know in which order we're going to evaluate the tensor contraction. So we declare the, the, the succession of contraction with respect with this evaluation order. So here we have two kinds of arrays and tensors. You have one, the ones that are just simple and n-dimensional arrays like A, U, and D. And from A, T to V, we have tensors because they um, imply loop domains that have to be um, manipulated at some point. So since we want to apply transformations from these loop domains, we want to associate them with a set of iterators that we represent the, the name of the, the, the loop iterators. So we will use the construct build to associate a tensor with a list of iterator, and the build will construct implicitly a loop that will respect the pattern of the tensor operator. So since D here was the, the, entry, the, the result of the entry of multiplication, it, the pattern will respect this, um, uh, the, sorry, the entry of multiplication pattern, and the same goes on for the contractions. So uh, when we have this list of iterators and we know what they use, we can now apply them, um, use them to apply transformations here, for instance, maybe a succession of loop interchanges. So um, as an example of assessing different variants of, uh, uh, of the pro of program transformations here, um, we can consider, as an example, three different variants of um, trying to deal with column major accesses. The first variant in, written in our language, L1, um, proposes to deal with that with loop interchanges on the end parallelization, on the mesh loop using OpenMP. And the variant L2 uses also loop interchanges, but tries to uh, deal with column major accesses of A by introducing the explicit data transposition of the tensor. And L3 uh, does approximately the same, this time L3 is going to deal with the transpositions of the tensor from TMP1 to TMP6 by playing with the access function. 
And the main difference between L2 and L3 is that L2 introduces a new loop to copy the transpositions, whereas in L3, it's just playing with the access function, so the, there's no need to introduce a new loop for that. And for our variants, we noticed that the best performances were, were a result of the variant L3, since we didn't, we were able to get rid of almost all column major accesses without any additional cost of copying. And with some, a, a bit of comparison with um, some Pluto outputs, we, we tried to generate some, some variants using Pluto with a different type of heuristics, that's not exhaustive. But Pluto 1 is a variant where there's only loop interchange, parallelization, and vectorization. When Pluto does the vectorization, it explicitly marks a given dimension with track mass in this instance. In Pluto 2, it, it also does loop interchanges, but with uh, additional um, fusions that I call partial because it's not going to try to fuse every opportunity of fusion, but rather select the best one that it, it assumes to be. And the third heuristic of Pluto is to completely fuse whatever can be fused. And among all of these variants, the best one appears to be Pluto 1. Um, but we're still optimistic because one difference between our variants and those of Pluto is that, as I said, when I specify vectorization, it means that Pluto will add a, a, a pragma on the given dimension to avoid the vectorization. In our variants, we, we didn't do the same. We just let the compiler decide where to vectorize. But we also noticed much more recently, we, after even we uh, submitted this paper, we noticed that it, the compiler choices were not necessarily the best one because it also depend on the data sizes. And we noticed that when we were playing with which dimension should be um, vectorized, we were able to get more performances than what the default choice for the compiler. So the, what, we are quite optimistic here because we are able to reach almost the level of speed that we can have with Pluto with dealing with data layouts only. So we think that if we apply vectorization and more loop onloading, we can possibly uh, outperform the, this variant of Pluto. So to conclude, we are currently working on an intermediate language that could be used not only in the CFD domain, but also in any application that involves tensor applications, uh, tensor computations, and beyond, if possible. And uh, the main idea is to have really flexible and modular building blocks to be able to compose them, compose them easily. So we also want to be able to, to access different variants, either through metaprogramming or auto tuning techniques. And currently, we're working on the, the syntax, because this is not the final syntax, and the format semantics, and applications to other